This episode is brought to you by AudioQuest, makers of the mythical series Analog Interconnects. Click the link in the show notes for more information. Today we're going to talk about how your listening room or your lounge room or whatever room you have your speakers in is messing up the sound of vocals, percussion and acoustic guitars coming out of those speakers. Yeah, seriously. I'm also hopefully going to talk about what you can do about it. Before we get started, I want to show you this. This is the new House of Love box set, which is basically eight CDs of their major label albums from the early 90s. And I bought this from the label, Cherry Red. Cherry Red do some amazing reissues these days, actually. And the box set is called Burn Down the World. And because I bought it from Cherry Red, I got a signed postcard from lead singer Guy Chadwick. There's a little postcard there. And yeah, it's called Burn Down the World. Right, so Guy Chadwick on the postcard wrote burn. At least he tried to, in fact, it comes out looking like bum. Anyway, I mentioned this because in this box set is the, the classic, fans will know, the Butterfly album. And the Butterfly album features a track called In A Room. And track number nine, In A Room, was one of three test tracks that I took to hi-fi stores in the very early 90s to decide what kind of hi-fi gear I was gonna buy. Because this track in a room features acoustic guitars, vocals, and percussion. Last November, I had this room fully acoustically treated by Portugal's Vicoustic. Got panels on the ceiling, panels on that wall, panels on that wall, panels on the front wall, although I took two of them down to put the TV up there. And I've also got actually a couple of panels behind the door on this side that you can't see. Now, when I say fully treated, <laughs> I mean the whole room was treated, not the whole frequency spectrum of sound that will come out of full range loudspeakers because Vicoustic only specified some fairly small bass traps in that corner behind me, so in the front left corner, and another sort of tower of three in the rear right corner. So the treatment here doesn't really tackle low bass, not at all. I've still got a 35 hertz room mode problem. Solving bass issues in a room like this involves lots and lots and lots of bass traps. Far more than I'm prepared to live with. I did try it a little bit with some stuff from GIK a couple of years ago. I had about eight of them and I hated having them in here. So you might quite legitimately be thinking, well, what the hell did I do this for? Well, it's because I did it really to treat the mid range and the high frequencies. So basically the sounds of acoustic guitars, vocals, and percussion, among many other things. But these panels don't just even out the frequency response of the room. They also treat its, its time domain performance. Really like what happens to the sounds once they come out of the speakers. So we've all heard a live room, right? You've all heard a live room where the sound comes out of the speakers and it sort of snookers around the room. So it hits the walls and then the ceiling and then arrives at your ear late. And so what you end up hearing is a combination of the direct sound from the loudspeakers and the reflected sound that sort of bounced all around the room. That is therefore called a live room. It's called live because there's lots of reverberation. Sometimes this is just called reverb. And reverb, generally in, well, all but like a small amount of it is a problem. So for example, if a room has a one second reverb at a certain set of frequencies, what that means is when that certain set of frequencies comes out of the loudspeakers, you'll hear that direct sound from the loudspeaker, 
but then you'll also hear the reflected sound one second later. So as music's kind of constantly playing, you're always hearing the direct sound from the speaker and then the one second delayed, reflected, distorted sound, right? And this is how your room can mess with the sound of percussion, vocals, and acoustic guitars. And when that reflected sound, that delayed reflected sound, combines with the direct sound at the listening position, we get something called the comb filter effect, where some frequencies are boosted and some frequencies are essentially lowered. And late arriving reflections, reverb, can also mess with the timing of sound. So this kind of confuses the brain. I mean, our brain does its best to sort of reorganize or make sense of direct and reflected sound, but it still makes it harder to listen to. Think about when you're trying to talk to somebody at a swimming pool, an indoor swimming pool, right? And you're trying to shout across the other side of the pool to them. And think about how much harder it is and how much harder your brain has to work to understand what they're saying. That's really, I mean, that's the ultimate live room, isn't it? The indoor swimming pool, because it's super, super, super reflective. And no listening room is really like that, although I had one that was pretty close in Australia for a while. But generally, I mean, those, I don't know how, I mean, a swimming pool, that would have a, a multi-second reverberation time, right? If you want to know more about this in a more sort of technical, yeah, I guess from a guy who knows more about this from a technical perspective, you need to check out my interview with professional acoustician Jesko Lohan. He lives here in Berlin. And we did a video interview actually three years ago this week. And it's a, it's a fascinating look at room acoustics. I'll put a link in the description box below. Now, why does any of this matter? Well, because when we're listening to music, even with the mid range and the highs, when we have a high reverb time in our room, it can make voices sound a bit hollow. It can introduce a ring to the room. So if you kind of have a percussive snap, you can sometimes hear the tail end of it sort of zing in the room. And it can also make the phantom center that the speakers draw between the, the speakers, it can make the definition of that image somewhat diffuse. But what if we have no reverb in our room? So basically no reflecting sound to interfere with what we're hearing at the listening position. I mean, there we would only hear the direct sound from the loudspeakers. That sounds pretty ideal, right? Because it's what's called a dry room, right? Like it would be ultimately dry, a reverb time of zero, right? No reflected sound would be super dry. We just hear the sound of the loudspeakers. Perfect, right? Well, not quite, because some amount of reverb gives music, subjectively speaking, a certain amount of life and a certain enjoyment factor that we wouldn't have if we just had the direct sound from the loudspeakers. So therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what is the exact sort of Goldilocks amount of reverb that we want from our room? Like how much is too high and how much is too little? Yesterday, I phoned Jesko Lohan to ask him this question actually, because he and I have become friends and he's, he's very generous with his time. I really appreciate that about him actually. He's always happy to answer my, I guess for him must be fairly dumb questions. He told me that even the best recording studios, so fully treated rooms, even the best recording studios in the world will have a sort of a reverb time of around 0.1 seconds, maybe just a bit above that. No room can physically possibly have a reverb time of zero. So having no reverb is pretty much impossible. Yesco also told me 
that a reverb time of say more than 0.6 seconds, so 600 milliseconds, that's when you'd begin to hear it, so 700, 800, you'd really begin to notice it and you'd, yeah, you'd hear it when you were listening to loudspeakers in that room. So Yesco said the ideal amount is roughly, roughly between 200 milliseconds and 500 milliseconds. And this seems to jive with the research that I did myself on the internet. Like professional acousticians who've published content on the net seem to be saying that in a listening room you need a reverb time of somewhere between yeah, 200 and 300 milliseconds, sometimes a little bit more, maybe 400, but that once you get above say 600 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds, then it starts to become a problem. Now I'm talking about reverb time here and I should really get a little bit more specific because what I'm talking about is a measurement called RT60. So reverb time 60. Now that 60 refers to how long it takes a certain frequency to drop in sound pressure level by 60 dB. So an RT60 measures a range of frequencies, right? Usually, usually from around 200 hertz, so where the sort of mid-range starts, to two kilohertz. So the sort of, this is the more sort of formal definition of a room's decay time or reverb time, RT60. And when Vicoustic sent me the spec sheet for this room's full treatment, they said, and actually I should really read this to you, it, they said that the, the average RT60 for a listening room should be within 300 milliseconds to 600 milliseconds in the frequency range from 250 hertz to four kilohertz. So that seems to jive with what I've read on the net, it jives with what Yesco Lohan tells me, a professional acoustician. So it all seems to point to really having, yeah, a reverb time, an RT60 of between 200 and let's say five or 600. That seems to be a reasonable target. The measurements, the measurements of this room, I have done them. I used a free piece of software called Room EQ Wizard and a room measurement microphone called the Umic One. I'm not gonna go into how to do all that today. There are plenty of tutorials on the net on how to measure your room with Room EQ Wizard. I promise you it's not hugely complicated, even though the software can look a little bit daunting from the outset. But I measured my room sort of response from the listening position here, I didn't go all the way around. And the RT60 of this room between 200 hertz and two kilohertz sits I mean, it goes up and down a little bit, but it sits between 200 milliseconds and 300 milliseconds. And I can hear, I can hear the difference. I mean, this room was a lot livelier. It, I guess the, you'd say that the RT60 was higher before I had these treatments, but this is the other thing that Yesco told me. He said like for small rooms, and he said, this is a small room. Small rooms, the RT60 measurement is really only very much a guide. You shouldn't put too much stock in it. You should trust your ears more than you should the graphs because he said there are all sorts of problems associated with measuring RT60 at the listening position in a small room. He did give me the technical explanation why, but I can't relay that here because I didn't quite understand it. But I guess it's, all I'm saying is the measurements, as usual, we have to be a little bit careful with them. But I guess what I'm saying is that I can hear that this room is vastly improved compared to how it was a couple of years ago or before the treatment went in and that it's RT60 sits between 200 and 300 milliseconds for the mid-range and for the treble. Now what do I mean by this room sounds better? Well, really what it is, and the first thing I noticed, this is, this is the big one actually, is that voices, vocals, have a much richer tonality. And the zing in the top end of the room is completely gone. Like if I click my fingers, I don't know whether I'm gonna blow out the microphone here doing this. If I click my fingers, there's no zing in this room, none at all, which is wonderful. And also the stereo image, the phantom center, has better, crisper, 
definition. It's like nudging a lens into focus. Those are the audible improvements that lowering the reverb time of this room has brought me. But again, Yesco also told me, the internet also tells me, Vicoustic tell me that a reverb time, an RT60 of 600 milliseconds or above thereabouts would be audible. So remember, my professional acoustician friend Jesko Lohan said that a room with a reverb time of 600 milliseconds or more would be audible. Can you hear that? I mean, can you hear that? You can probably hear it. You can probably hear it. For our side-by-side -side comparison today, we've come to my neighbor's apartment. So behind the wall behind me is my lounge room. So my neighbor's lounge room is basically the mirror of mine. So six meters by five meters. And yeah, in here though, the, there isn't any attention paid to room acoustics. And you can probably hear it. You can probably hear it. We've got a couch, coffee table, some bookshelves along this wall, a, a kind of a poofy type thing here, but it's still pretty much a typical lounge room, right? This is how most people would live if they moved into an apartment like this. So you can probably hear that this room has a lot of reverb going on. It does not sound good at all, right? I mean, if I... You can hear the zing in the end, right? At the, the tail end of that sound. That's the room's high frequency reverb. And just like with my room, we can measure that reverb using Room EQ Wizard. So I brought with me here a pair of KEF LS50 Meta. I've got a Blue Sound Power Node as the amplifier, and I've hooked up my Room EQ Wizard measurement system. So basically, Bridging the gap between my laptop and the power node is a topping D10S, so it converts USB to Toslink. Then I connect the microphone to the laptop as well, and then we generate a frequency sweep, and then that sweep is heard by the microphone and then analyzed by Room EQ Wizard to give us an RT60 reading. The surprising, I guess the spicy finding actually for this video, is that the RT60 for this room between 200 hertz and two kilohertz isn't the car crash that I thought it would be. I thought this room would have a measurable reverb of over a second, but the graph shows us that the reverb sort of sits, well, it dances around a lot more than mine, but I'd say it was minimum is about 450 and maximum is about 650 milliseconds. So it doesn't look that bad, but remember what Yesco said, we can't really put 100% stock in those measurements and we have to trust our ears. And it's clear to me that this room sounds significantly worse than my own. But if we do trust the measurements, then it's quite clear that a room with a RT60 in the mid range and the treble of around 500 milliseconds or 600 milliseconds is clearly audible. And that RT60 will definitely, definitely mess with the sound that, you know, the mid-range sound that comes out of the loudspeakers and the treble, the high frequency sound that comes out of the loudspeakers. You know, like those percussion sounds and those acoustic guitar strums and Guy Chadwick's vocal on In A Room by The House Of Love. So back in my room, you can probably hear the difference already, right? Can you hear that? Now, some of you might quite rightly be thinking, well, can't my neighbor fix her room reverb in, in software using room compensation software like Dirac or Room Perfect or another type of software system? And the answer is no, you can't. Because what reverb is, is essentially what happens to the sound once it's out of the speaker. Now, if you have a room, a bit like my neighbors, that has a lot of reverb, one thing you can do is move your listening position closer to your speakers. Because the closer the listening position is to the speakers, the less we hear of the room itself. 
Conversely, the further we sit away from the loudspeakers, the more we hear of the room. And in a typical setup like mine, where I'm like two, two and a half meters from my speakers, as my friend Yesko said in the interview we did a few years ago. In a typical untreated living room, if you are just listening to your speakers, you're, you're basically listening to up 50 to 70% room. What you're hearing is more room than actual speaker. What about rugs? Now this is a thing that comes up a lot. Yes, I have a rug on my floor here. Yes, it's a thick rug. No, it doesn't really do much for the acoustic properties of this room, or rather it doesn't really do much to the reverb time of this room. Why is that? Well, because if you, if you Google this, if you look up the absorption coefficient of a rug or a carpet, you will see that it only really hits about 15% at one kilohertz, and it gets to about 40 or 50% at 10K. So it, it'll take a little bit of the sting out of the treble, but not too much. And that's the thing, isn't it? When you look at photos of professional recording studios or even amateur recording studios or professional listening rooms, you see room treatments like this. I mean, if we could get away with just loading the room with furniture and putting a rug down, we would. But that's what I call a half measure or a 25% measure or a 10% measure because it doesn't do as much as treating the room properly and professionally with visually intrusive acoustic panels like these. And I know this from experience. For the first few years of living here, I did try you know, the whole, well, if I fill it out with furniture, it's gonna sound better. And it does a little bit. It does sound a little bit better. But that's not enough. That's not really enough to get it to the reverb time that I have right now. I guess what I'm saying is, is that rugs and other furniture, that might be all you can do, sure. But that doesn't mean it is the same as putting acoustic panels on the walls and the ceiling. It does not give you the same results. I know this from years of experience of trying to convince myself that that's not the case. But now having done this, I can tell you both audibly and from a measurement point of view with Room EQ Wizard, that this room is miles better than how it used to sound. And we know how it used to sound when I first moved in because we've just heard my neighbor's room. You can probably hear it. And arguing against professionals like me, Am I a professional? I guess I am to some degree. Arguing against us treating our room with acoustic panels because it bears little resemblance to the real world, to what some of you might hear at home, is a bit like saying to BMW, look, you don't need to bother with your Nürburgring testing because you've got a, an autobahn just down the road and that's more real world. Or it's a bit like saying that the Top Gear presenters don't need to use a test track to test a, I don't know, a three-door family saloon car when the M1 or the M6 is nearby. These kinds of, I won't say ultimate, because this is not the ultimate room, not by any stretch, but sort of better listening environments allow people like me to hear more from a pair of speakers or from the electronics connected to those loudspeakers. Conversely, with a poorer sounding room, the more likely I am to misjudge a pair of speakers or an amplifier or a DAC or a streamer. Or I might favor certain kinds of sounds more. So in a fairly lively sounding room, I might prefer a warmer sound and not really realize that I'm doing that. Now sure, you could absolutely argue against putting up acoustic panels like these from an aesthetics point of view, and I would never disagree with you. But this is the compromise that you have to make if you want to optimize to the max the sound of a listening room without actually building that listening room from scratch. You could put up a few acoustic panels just here and there, but then again, you're gonna get a kind of here and there result. You're not gonna get the full result that you have from treating the entire room. Again, 
Half measures give you half results. One quarter measures give you one quarter results. And I'm sure that if many professionals could fully treat their room with just a few panels, they do so, right? This is one of the biggest uh, mistakes that I've seen people uh, making is that they strongly underestimate how much treatment you need. And he's kind of right, because that's where I've arrived at, you know, having lived with these Vicoustic panels for, yeah, the best part of nine months, a bit like a pregnancy. You know, I can, I can definitely say that they absolutely make one heck of a difference. But if you're thinking, well, there's no way I could do that. There's no way I'd be allowed to, to do that. I don't know why people say that, but whatever. If you can only do one wall or one surface rather, I recommend you do the ceiling. And I know that Yesco, he said this to me yesterday independently of me thinking this because and I know that Olaf will bear this out. When we had this installed, we did the ceiling first. It made a huge difference to the sound of this room when the ceiling went up. And also, it's the least visually intrusive of, I think, all of this stuff, really, because I've got diffusers on the back wall. You can't ignore them. But I could probably just about ignore what's on the ceiling. And it makes a tremendous difference to the sound of this room. So I'm saying, if you are only a sort of half measures kind of person, or you can only do that, do the ceiling first, or do the ceiling. It makes, yeah, it makes a difference. Now, even if you can't do any of this, I hope that this video has been entertaining because that's what I'm really on YouTube for, is to be, well, I guess it's kind of like edutainment, isn't it? A little bit of education along the way. I hope you now have a better understanding of what reverb is and how it can affect what you hear in the listening position and also what an ideal amount of reverb in a room might look like from a numbers point of view. So between, I don't know, 200, 300, maybe 400. We also know from going to my neighbor's apartment that 500, 600, 650 really is extremely audible. But maybe you, you know, want to download Room EQ Wizard, buy a room measurement mic for 100 bucks and see what measurements you get in your room. Maybe you're interested. Hopefully this video inspires you to think about this and maybe do something. Maybe. Because I think that thinking about the sound of your room is the number one thing you should do before dropping big money on a new pair of speakers or a new amp or if you're just setting out a hi-fi system. And if you've got, you know, several thousand dollars to spend, you might want to think, well, hang on, maybe I should set aside a couple of grand to improve the sound of my room first before I go and buy new speakers, new amp, new DAC, new streamer, new turntable, new whatever. I know it's not as sexy, but I promise you that once you hear it, and hopefully you've, you've heard some of the improvements in this video, with the side-by-side -side comparison with my neighbor's apartment, hopefully having heard that, you will understand better, you'll have a better grasp on what acoustic panels, as visually intrusive as they are, what they can do for you. Anyway, yeah, this was a long video, wasn't it? A long video, but if you stuck through to this point, thank you very much, and if you kind of like this video, you found it at all useful or entertaining, please give us a like down below. If you like my attitude towards high-end audio in that, it pretty much always factors in the room, even I'm, I'm not always talking about it. The next video will tackle room compensation software. If you're at all curious, basically, I think that room compensation software is best at dealing with bass problems. And those are actually the biggest problems you have in a small room like this. I chose to kind of tackle the reverb being the other really big problem. So that's out of the way. So all I have to deal with now is bass. I can do that in software. We'll talk about that when we talk about the Dyn Audio speakers that I've got behind me. So if you dig all of that, then please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.